Thank you very much for your kind introduction, Chair, and um, all of the audience for being here and for our previous speaker. I think we're just getting the slides up after our small technical glitch. Here we go. It's all done. It's good. Um, so thank you. Um, this paper which I'm presenting on behalf of a team, which I'm part of for an Australian Research Council funded project, um, is titled, this project is titled Western Australian Legacies of British Slavery, and it's focused on the development of digital tools to map narratives and data relating to slave trade migration and the legacies of British slavery in Australia from the 1830s. This is a data intensive project tracing the movement of people, capital and culture from slave owning Britain to Western Australia. You know, it seems like a long way away, a place that's not necessarily linked with the slave trade as we may know it. But you know, as we're finding in this project, vitally important in terms of the compensation funds that were paid to um, slavers, slave owners and plantation owners at, at the time of the abolition of slavery in the 1830s, which was the time when the Western Australian colony where I live in Perth was established. So it's a sort of fascinating um, and important <coughs> historical connection which isn't widely um, researched or known about. Um, so we're, ex we're exploring the impacts of slavery wealth in shaping colonial immigration, investment and law in Australia. And we're also exploring the experience of Aboriginal people in relation to the history of slavery. So I'll begin with the introduction to this Western Australian Slavery's Legacy Project, which I'll just refer to as the WA Slavery Project, although that doesn't sound quite right, um, <laughs> but it's uh, um, you know, an abbreviation. And I'll also uh, refer to this time-layered cultural map, which is an infrastructure project in Australia, which we've been using to visualise some of the project's data. And, and after that, I'll discuss some of the major questions and tensions that have emerged out of gathering and visualizing this data so far. How do I do this? There we go. Okay, it's good. Um, can I go back one? Did I go forward two? No, it's okay. There was only one. Okay. Um, so this WA Slavery Project is tracing the movement of people, property, capital and culture from Britain to Western Australia, exploring the links between slavery and the British Empire and settler colonialism. And in particular, it's focused on detailed biographical investigations into a series of individuals connected to slavery who were some of the earliest colonists in Western Australia. Mm. This research has grown out of the University College London's Legacies of British Slavery Project, which started by tracing the £20 million in compensation money paid out to British slavers following the abolition of slavery in 1833. By examining the records of claims made for this compensation money, this project identified around 46,000 claimants, as well as thousands of plantations and estates, and, and it's an you know, incredibly important resource for, for research. The WA Slavery Legacies Project builds on this research by tracing individuals who moved to the settler colonies in Australia. And it wasn't just Australia. It was a worldwide pattern of uh, those who received compensation funds um, at the ending of slavery, going to the colonies, you know, outwards from the British Empire, but we're focusing in particular on Australia and th in this project on Western Australia. So it, it builds on, on this um, research that was done in the UK. Um, and the research so far has revealed some striking patterns including the migra migration of a number of British slavers and slave trade beneficiaries from select Caribbean estates to Western Australia in the early 1830s. 
And some of the key data being gathered includes names, professions, family relations, business associates, associates um, their capital, and connections to particular estates. And it also traces individuals' movements, activities and influence in the state of Western Australia, including amounts and locations of land occupied and affiliations with particular businesses, institutions and government. So this kind of data, looking at the movement of people, the distribution of networks and land, lends itself to mapping and geographical visualisations. This project I'm showing here, the Time Layered Cultural Map, or TLC map, is a national infrastructure uh, that is a set of tools for humanities researchers to compile human uh, historical and cultural data using spatiotemporal coordinates. It's not a singular map or literal map per se, but rather a range of accessible software or a software ecosystem that allows researchers with minimal programming skills to upload, gather, analyze, and visual, visualize data themselves. So these two projects, I'm, which I'm involved, I'm involved with both of them in, in different ways, this infrastructure project and this um, sort of more pure research project about the history of slavery, there was a, a very good alignment. They were funded at the same time, and we, so we decided to use this infrastructure uh, to help to visualize some of the data that was being produced from the slavery project. Um, so of all of these tools within the TLC map, we chose the Gazetteer of Historical Australian Places. And interestingly, as the previous speaker has mentioned, you know, place names change over time. And, and one of the biggest jobs has been to enrich this gazetteer of historical place names with change over time, but also Aboriginal names, um, all sorts of changing boundaries of places. And that's been a, a huge part of this infrastructure project. So this, this gazetteer allows researchers to create layers on a 3D map which pinpoint locations with accompanying information along with a movable timeline. And this tool has allowed us to plot out the journeys of slavers and slave trade beneficiaries as they moved across Britain, the Caribbean and Western Australia. And for a pilot project, we selected six individuals, um, creating a separate layer for each. If you can forward it for me, something's not working with this button. Perfect. Okay, great. So these layers were updated, uh, uploaded as CSV files converted from Excel spreadsheets. And data on each of these individuals was uh, included latitude and longitude for each geographical place they visited or lived in, place names, short biographical summary text, and links to data stored on other databases and archives. And what this uh, translated to was, in the 3D form, was a, a staged journey for each individual. And I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about the comment in the previous paper about maps as being a form of storytelling and narrative. And you know, I think there's a lot of work that we can still do to, to make that maps you know, a, a true form of storytelling and narrative. But here we've done the best that we can with the available infrastructure. And the next stage of that infrastructure project is actually to try to work with museums and other kinds of um, you know, organ cultural organizations to think about how can we really use this data in a way that can reach the public. So here we have staged journeys for each individual represented by, at the moment, a series of points on the map accompanied by brief narrative text regarding time spent at that location, links to images and further resources, including records to, uh, linking to other collections and data sets, such as the University College London database. While other databases and tools you know, may be available, enable 
network analysis to reveal, for example, family, business, and other connections between individuals, and there are a number of these in Australia as there are in, you know, around the world, this TLC map project is the only purpose-designed infrastructure in Australia to visually represent these connections, allowing rep uh, researchers to identify geographical clusters and parallel journeys by site. There are a number of challenges uh, in this work, and, and this is an in-progress pro project. It's a short paper about a project that is still running and will complete at the end of the year and has future stages. Um, the issue of missing or fuzzy data was a, a recurrent one, as the individuals of interest nearly 200 years, they often had very limited records. And especially when, when we're dealing with the, uh, um, those who were enslaved rather than the slavers themselves, there's very few records of, of, of those. At times we could identify accurate spatial coordinates, but much of the time this information was less precise. For example, as I'm showing here, an individual's diary entry referring to a broad region or a former place name that no longer exists. In these instances we needed to make estimates and included a field for notes where we could explain the limitations of our data and our process for devising estimations. And actually, I think this is a critical part of uh, you know, utilising this kind of software is recognising where we don't have the available data and not trying to kind of smooth it over or try to create a full picture when, we, when that information isn't available. Several tensions and questions also emerged around power and bias. Data are never found, as we know, but always created through many moments of complex interpretation and decision making. In the WA Slavery Project, we noticed the influence of colonial frameworks underlying our data. For example, the names, lives, and experiences of Aboriginal people, migrants, people of colour, were frequently obscured or written out of colonial records. We employed several methods in attempting to deconstruct these colonial underpinnings. The use of language was central uh, in this regard. For example, using Aboriginal place names in addition to non-Aboriginal ones and using term, terms like colonised rather than settled or discovered in the narrative text. And although this, this seems like a simple kind of intervention, we felt that it was really important to foreground this as part of the method. Images also offered a powerful means by which to counter bias. When searching archives, the major majority of images were colonial era sketches, paintings, photographs, and maps. And we've tried to balance these with a selection of contemporary Aboriginal artworks, such as the one that I'm showing here. As a kind of dialogue, it's not really a dialogue in the sense of a conversation as we know it, but rather a juxtaposition of interpretations of the same place from different perspective and at a different time. And just in closing, um, although it remains in a theoretical stage, we've also looked at presenting data in non-linear, non-hierarchical -hier formats. Rather than data appearing through a series of stages in which users begin by clicking on place names and then which then lead to more layers or hierarchies of information. In, in, in this sort of vision of what this infrastructure could, could present, um, text would be given, uh, well, all images would appear at once. All place names, images, links, and pieces of text would be given equal prominence. The lead developer, software developer of this TLC map, Bill Pascoe, describes this democratizing approach using the metaphor of a tree rather than presenting data in a structured hierarchy akin to branches and trunks, rather presenting it like a collection of leaves. Future research could experiment with how this might look in practice. Uh, the next step in our project is to extend the pilot project that we've begun to include a wider selection of individuals incorporating findings from the WA Slavery Project, which will be ongoing till the end of this year and has a future stage next year. 
And we also intend to use the TLC map to generate visualizations for use in academic publications, in teaching, for public communication, and for other research purposes. Thank you very much.